tell you, I love music, and I thought the worship team killed it today. Thanks, you guys, for leading us. Yeah, awesome. And you all sound so good. You sing so well. Thanks for being here and worshiping with us. For those of you online as well, uh, it's awesome when people use their gifts for the glory of God, isn't it? Uh, we have tech people that use their gifts. We have, how about that parking team, that waving team in the parking lot? Like, they use their gifts, right? We got our kids community team right now down at the other end. It's so awesome to see so many volunteers using their gifts to serve Jesus. And I'm glad you're here with us as well. Music for me has always been a real big part of my life. I remember when I was younger um, on the weekends. By the way, does anybody remember uh, the buzzard WMMS? Does anybody remember the buzzard? Okay. It's for us older people, the buzzard. Well, when, when I was a kid, they had these countdowns. And so I got a question for you this morning. It's, it's a pretty difficult question. Seems easy at first, but what is the greatest song of all time? Think about that for just a second. There are so many different musical genres, different types of music, uh, different categories of music. It might seem like an easy one, but when I was listening to the buzzard, not that good Christian boys did that back in the day, but when I was listening to the buzzard, WMMS, on the weekends, they would have these countdowns. They would come like the top 500 songs of all time. And by the time it got to the top 10, when you were my age, you always knew what song was going to be number one. Steve, hit it, buddy. Sing along with me if you know it, everybody. Ooh. And she's buying the stairway to heaven. Yeah, give him a hand, Steve. Saxa. Woo. Somebody told me it's not Jimmy Page you look like, it's Howard Stern. So I don't know. <laughs> don't know if that was a compliment or not, but... But you think about what the greatest song of all time, and this one might strike you a little differently, but we're going to study the greatest song of all time according to King Solomon. Now, it might not seem like a song to you because it's been translated from Hebrew uh, uh, into English. It's 2,000 some years later. But the song of Solomon, the song of songs was the greatest song of all time, according to King Solomon. As we finish up our study in the poetic literature, this is the book we're going to study today. We're going to talk a little bit about, and I just have to warn you, <clears throat> like so many songs today, this one gets a little hot and heavy with sex, okay? So just stick with me. We're going to try to keep it PG-13, but it's right from the Bible, everybody. So we'll take it one step at a time. Would you pray with me? And then we'll jump into God's word today. So glad you're here to join us today. Heavenly Father, we love you and we are grateful for music, for the ability to laugh and have fun in church, to be able to, to worship a God who laughs and uh, has a sense of humor, a God who pursues us with his love. God, thank you for your love. Thank you that we can sing and worship you and, and remind ourselves of how great your love really is. And God, I pray that you would give us the ability, uh, even as Tony mentioned during worship, to love others the way you love us. So uh, be our teacher right now through the power of your Holy Spirit as we open up your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, I invite you to take it out and try to find the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. There's Bibles available at each of the doors. You can follow along in the app as well. Song of Solomon. There has been quite a debate about this book for years uh, among scholars. So I'm going to give you the four main ways that scholars believe this should be interpreted. Okay, way number one is they believe that this is a book about the love between a husband and a wife. King Solomon and the Shulamite woman. A woman from Shulam, which was a town kind of near Jerusalem. It's the, a song about their wedding night before the bride would come in to her chambers, to the groom's chambers. That's one way of interpreting this text. Number two, it's about the love God has for his chosen people, Israel. Some scholars believe that's the way you should interpret this text. Number three, it's about the love that Christ has for his bride, the church. So there's a lot of symbolism throughout the text. That's the third way of interpreting it. And number four, it's about the love God has for all of us as human beings. 
So what I would like to say is, I believe it's a combination of all four of those views. Like those are great theories, but what I want us to follow is this thread throughout the text today. And if you're taking notes, here's the big idea. The big idea is that true love has the power to transform your life. True love has the power to transform your life. Now, a few interesting facts about this book that I want you to know before we jump into it. Song of Songs is a, one of only two books in the Bible that doesn't mention the word God at all. How about that? Esther is another one. I got corrected after first service. It was good. People were listening, right? So there's only two books in the Bible, Esther and the Song of Solomon. No mention of God throughout this. How did it end up in the canon of Scripture? And yet it did. Another thing to know is that, again, I think I mentioned this already, but the book was originally written as a song or as a poem. Now, it's not going to translate for us, but in the Hebrew, it was a beautiful song. And that's why Solomon calls it the Song of Solomon of songs. The poem is really a conversation between Solomon and his bride on their wedding night. And in this section we're about to read, it's the bride, it's the woman who does the talking first. So I want you to follow along with us in uh, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 2 is where I'll start reading. Here's what the scripture says. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Oh man, we are into it already. I can see those smiles out there. Like, this is what this book is about. Kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. Now, what's so significant about this is it's, it's the woman who talks first. And this is very unusual in the Hebrew text. She's putting herself on the same footing as the man. And in fact, she is bold. She is confident. And she does more of the talking, more of the speaking throughout the text. So I want you to see what she uh, says next. Turn over to chapter 2, starting in verse 3. She goes on to say, Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. I gotta be honest with you, I've never heard my wife say she delights to sit in my shade. <laughs> There's a whole lot of shade she could sit in, you know? But she's never, she's never said that, and yet this woman is so overwhelmed with love. That little phrase that you see at the end of verse seven, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Shows up three different times throughout the text. Like that tends to be a theme throughout the book of Song of Solomon. Solomon and his bride understand how powerful true love really is. And what she's saying here in verse 7, if you look at it again, is still great advice for our relationships today. She's saying you can't force love. You shouldn't, in the, in the words of the Supremes, you can't hurry love. Remember that song? Right? That's what she's saying here. Don't hurry love. Be patient with real love. Wait for it to blossom. Or as one commentator put it, and I, I love this, you might want to take a picture of this. A true experience of love is too powerful, too all-consuming, to be lightly aroused. Unless the couple have the commitment, the desire, and the right opportunity to enjoy it. And that's why. You ready for this? That's why in Christ-centered relationships, sexual love is best reserved for a marriage relationship. Sexual love is best reserved for a marriage relationship. And, and I get it. You're sitting here going, oh, Grandpa Dave, <laughs> he's at it again. Boy, is he out of date. Boy, is Grandpa Dave old-fashioned. I wish we could find a church where the pastor was a little more relevant with the culture because Grandpa Dave is out of touch. Doesn't he know that everybody has sex these days before marriage? Everybody has sex outside of marriage. After all, it's just sex. What's the big deal? 
I'm here to tell you that I'm not here to embarrass anybody. I'm not here to shame anybody. Trust me on this. Melody and I, believe it or not, were both young once too. <laughs> we know how strong those feelings are. Like we totally remember those days. What I'm trying to tell you in love is what the Bible seems to say. And it says that God's best is to express sex in the context of a marriage relationship. That's what's best. That's how you experience true love. And he says throughout scripture that a marriage relationship, a Christian marriage, is one man and one woman for an entire lifetime together. That's what the scripture seems to say. And why does he tell us this? Because he loves us. He wants what's best for us. He wants us to experience love the way he created it, the way he designed it. That intimate, sexual, powerful love in a marriage relationship. Let me tell you this. That kind of love has the power to transform your life. When you experience it with another human being. When you see the kind of love that's available. My question for all of us is, do we believe God enough to take him at his word? Do we trust him enough? The creator of this incredible gift. The kind of love that he designed us to experience. Now, let's see how Solomon responds to his bride. Because his bride's been doing the talking. Let's go to chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And this is now Solomon responding. And he says this. Some of this might surprise you. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats. I think we better pause right there. This is where we have to remember the Bible was written for us, but not to us, okay? Like, this is a different culture, right? We've got to put it in context. Gentlemen, do not, on the way home today, okay, in the car, don't look over at your wife and go, hey, baby, your hair looks like a flock of goats. I don't think she's going to take that as a compliment, okay? So let's, like, put it in context here, right? But this is what he's saying. He says, your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Check out this next line. This is deep. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Hey, baby, I'm glad you have all your teeth. That's the 2022 translation. Things were a little different back then. Verse 3, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your <clears throat> breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Woo! I told you it was going to get good. Some of you are going, this is in the Bible? They just said the word breasts. And I giggled like a junior high kid. That's pretty much... What happened? See, this section is where the, 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 the groom is describing how his bride looks coming into the wedding chambers on the wedding night. And this might seem a little foreign to us how he describes her here, but what he's saying is, this is the most beautiful creature I've ever seen in my life. She is incredible, both outside and inside. Her eyes, her hair, her, her neck, her beauty. Her beauty, not just on the outside, but her inner beauty. Gentlemen, if I could talk to the men in the room for just a second. Like, it is so important that we notice how beautiful our wives are. And it is so important that we tell them that. Over and over and over again. I have never met a woman that says, stop telling me how beautiful I am. Like, it's so important. It's so important to ask God to give you the eyes to see and that desire for your wife. That's what Solomon has here. And I know what some are saying. Yeah, it used to be that way, Dave, way back in the day, but you don't understand it now. I'm like in my 50s and some things have changed and I don't know if I have that same passion anymore. Pray and ask God for that same passion, right? 
Because it's not just an outer beauty, it's an inner beauty. It's a, it's a love that is faithful and committed and goes deeper than just that exterior. It notices the interior, the emotional beauty, the mental beauty, the spiritual beauty that your wife has. And it's this incredible picture all throughout this book of what real love is all about. Now, I'm going to let you read the rest of the book on your own. <laughs> Because it gets way more graphic than just what I'm telling you this morning, okay? But it describes this incredible kind of love that a man has for a woman in a marriage relationship and that our God has for us. And if you leave here today only hearing one thing, could you please hear this? The God of the universe desperately loves you. Desperately loves you. He loves you because he created you in his image, he created you for a relationship, and he wants to experience that deep intimacy that's meant to be experienced between a husband and wife. In that most intimate of moment, when a husband and wife are so close, the closest they can be, you following me married couples? That is a picture of how much God loves us. That's what's intended to remind us of of this God who pursues us no matter what, even when we walk away, even when we say, no, 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 God, I'm not that beautiful. Tell me some more, tell me some more. God loves you. He loves you so much that he took on flesh. The spirit God of the universe took on flesh in the person of Jesus and came to earth to show us how to live, to show us how to love to teach us what real love is all about. Agape love, like 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. The kind of love that doesn't keep a record of wrongs. The kind of love that forgives. The kind of love that isn't rude or isn't jealous, right? The kind of love that truly loves unconditionally. That's the kind of love God has for each one of you. And if you're here today and and you're still shaking off a, a, a hangover from last night and it was a long night and you dragged yourself to church and you don't even know what you're doing here. Here's what I want you to know. God's glad you're here. God loves that you're here. And he forgives you and he wants to live in relationship with you. And we're glad you're here too, just the way you are. That's what this table is all about. That's why we celebrate communion. We don't just celebrate communion because it's something the church just happens to do. We celebrate communion because it reminds us of this incredible God who loves us. You see, this little coffee creamer communion element that we have these days, on the bottom of it is a little piece of bread. And that piece of bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. The fact that our God took on flesh and came to earth to show us how to live, to show us what real love was about. How did he do that? He sacrificed himself. He sacrificed himself to defeat the powers of evil because the powers of evil wanted to destroy him just because he lived a life of love. And they nailed him to a cross. And even that couldn't hold him down. It's amazing. Three days later, he rose from the dead and this same God is alive today and he's pursuing a relationship with you. He loves you. His blood was shed, that's what the juice represents, so that he could defeat all those evil powers and come after you. He'll never let you go. I hope you know him. I hope you have a relationship with him and put your confidence in him today because that's what this is all about. We wanna help you find and follow the person of Jesus and experience his love. Would you do me a favor and bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm gonna invite our worship team to come forward and. We're going to worship with a song that talks all about this love, the the real kind of love that God has for us. But would you just take a minute right now to look at your life? And if there's something getting in the way of experiencing that kind of love, would you just talk to God about it? Ask him for his forgiveness. Turn back to him today. In fact, if you're here today and, and maybe your love has grown cold and it's not the same passionate love that you once had, would you ask God to renew your passion? To speak to you today. And would you thank him for this incredible sacrifice that he made with his body and his blood? 
just a few minutes, we're going to invite you to come forward and take an element back to your seat and celebrate communion at your own time and your own way. But to remember this incredible love, this all-consuming love that our Savior has for us. It's worth celebrating. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for this incredible gift. Thank you for the book of the Song of Songs, the greatest song ever, the song that sings about the love that you have for us. And we are so grateful, God. God, help us to live a life of love, to love others the way you've loved us. Thank you for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.